On behalf of the American Heart Association and No Diabetes by Heart, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Best Practices for Managing Diabetes in Patients Hospitalized with Heart Failure or Stroke. My name is Renee Sednu, and I am a Program Development Manager for Quality Outcomes Research and Analytics at the American Heart Association. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly review how to use this webinar platform for today's event. If you'd like a copy of today's presentation, you can download a PDF in the handout section of your attendee control panel. If you experience technical difficulties, most user issues can be resolved by refreshing your browser. If that does not work, please contact the GoToWebinar customer service team found in your confirmation and reminder email. At the conclusion of today's presentation, you will receive a link to access the recording as well as an invitation to complete our feedback survey. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters in the questions section of your attendee control pane. You may send in your questions at any time and we'll review them during our Q&A at the end of the presentation as time permits. Today's webinar will last one hour and 15 minutes. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and a major cause of heart attacks, strokes, and disability for people living with type 2 diabetes. The American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association, along with industry leaders, have proudly launched the groundbreaking collaborative initiative, No Diabetes by Heart, to reduce cardiovascular deaths, heart attacks, and strokes in people living with type 2 diabetes. The No Diabetes by Heart initiative supports quality improvement efforts by engaging directly with hospitals and outpatient clinics to provide long-term support to their teams of professionals as they redesign healthcare to better serve patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. AHA's target type two diabetes is a component of this broader initiative that aims to ensure patients with type two diabetes receive the most up-to-date evidence-based care. To bring attention to this critical high-risk population, American Heart Association has established the Target Type 2 Diabetes Honor Roll Recognition Opportunity for hospital participants of Get With the Guidelines Heart Failure and Get With the Guidelines Stroke. Hospitals with these modules have access to diabetes-related registry elements and reports. Hospitals that meet specific measure thresholds based on these elements may be eligible for recognition in the Target Type 2 Diabetes Honor Roll alongside their existing Get With the Guidelines awards. This past year, we gave out more than 1,400 Target Type 2 Diabetes Honor Roll awards. Award-winning hospitals receive national recognition in several locations shown on this slide. Congratulations to all. Today, we are thrilled to hear from three of our Target Type 2 Diabetes Honor Roll award-winning hospitals, McLaren Northern Michigan, Maui Memorial Medical Center, and Southeast Health. It is now my pleasure to provide brief introductions for each of our speakers. Nicole Murray and Betsy pollock tydeck join us from McLaren Northern Michigan. Nicole is the Stroke Program Coordinator. She provides oversight of the stroke program operations, as well as foundational support to colleagues to maximize patient outcomes. As the chairperson of the Stroke Collaborative Council, Nicole facilitates interprofessional and interdepartmental implementation of performance improvement initiatives to improve outcomes of the stroke patient population across the continuum of care. Betsy is the inpatient diabetes care and education specialist at McLaren Northern Michigan. She provides ongoing diabetes education and support for nurses and is a resource for providers caring for patients with diabetes. Betsy has a passion for diabetes and loves working with the staff and providers to provide excellent diabetes care and education to patients while hospitalized with a smooth transition to outpatient care. Welcome to Nicole and Betsy. Representing Maui Memorial Medical Center, we have Leslie Lexier, and Dr. Kimball Poon. Leslie has more than 30 years of professional nursing experience and is currently a quality management data analyst at Maui Memorial Medical Center. 
In her role, she is responsible for monitoring and evaluating the quality and appropriateness of care provided to patients, collecting and reviewing data on patient care to identify problems, seeking ways to improve patient care and clinical performance, and implementing best practices. Dr. Kimball Poon is, a board, is board certified in cardiovascular disease and cardiac electrophysiology. He believes his purpose as a physician is to help patients understand health and disease and to guide them in making decisions about their care. Welcome Dr. Poon and Leslie. Finally, I'd like to introduce Regina Moore and Morgan uh, Seamer from Southeast Health. Regina Moore is a registered respiratory therapist who worked clinically 28 years before moving to quality. She works as a data abstractor and performance improvement team leader and is a certified Lean Six, Six Sigma Greenbelt. She has led the heart failure team at Southeast Health for four years. Morgan Seamer is an advanced practice registered nurse who joined the congestive heart failure clinic at Southeast Health in March, 2020. She received her master's of science in nursing from Maryville University. Welcome Regina and Morgan. It is now my pleasure to turn today's presentation over to McLaren Northern Michigan. Nicole, the floor is yours and you have control to advance your slides. Thank you, Renee. Um, I'm just waiting for the slide to advance. I'm not seeing it advance. Do you see it advance on your side? Do you wanna give it one more um, movement forward? I can see that you have control. So one more click or forward arrow. There you go. Great. All right. Thank you, Renee, for this opportunity to share about our stroke program and our process improvement initiatives that focus on patients with diabetes. I apologize that I'm not on the webcam. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty today. Um, and we'll be patient as the slides hopefully will advance here shortly. Um, this, I wanted to take a moment just to provide some perspective on our geographic location and the service area, along with our logistical hurdles and the distance challenges in providing care to our local communities. Our service area encompasses the tip of the mitt and Eastern Upper Peninsula, and it's honestly connected by a five mile expansion bridge called the Mighty Mac that does pose significant challenges throughout the year with high winds and weather. We provide care to several islands. Um, one of them has extremely high tourist traffic during peak season. Some of you may have actually even been there. It's a international site uh, to visit, uh, Mackinac Island. Um, but honestly, the utilization of our telestroke network and the collaboration with our EMS and air transport teams are pivotal to our ability to provide that excellent stroke care. I know that's probably a different topic and potential future webinar, but I wanted to recognize that this rural communities that need to come together and they pool resources in order to maximize outcomes. And we are blessed to have that level of support and collaboration here at McLaren. McLaren Northern Michigan is an acute care hospital. Um, it has 202 beds and we have approximately 230 physicians on staff um, encompassing 31 different specialties, approximately 1700 employees. And one of the things that really kind of set us apart is we do have a very strong donor loyalty to this regional hospital that does allow us to have the degree of specialties available to us. One of them, you know, just kind of spotlighting some of them is our emergency services, as well as 24-7 neurology and neurosurgical services that support, obviously, our stroke program, as well as a robust cardiovascular service line with CT surgery, TAVR, Watchman, electrophysiology, interventional cardiology, and TCAR. In oncology, we uh, also affiliate with Carmano's Cancer Institute. Um, we have a robust orthopedic service line, as well as general surgery that does support a trauma program as well. And we have inpatient and outpatient rehabilitative services. This is just kind of spotlighting some of the awards and um, accreditations that our hospital holds. 
Our healthcare team and leadership continue to strive for excellence to maximize the outcomes for our patients and communities in which we serve. And just one of them, just kind of you know focusing on, we are obviously um, a primary stroke center, but we also have a verified level two trauma center um, as well. And <clears throat> we work diligently to continue to meet and exceed our expectations um, to achieve these awards. To identify opportunities for improvement in key strategic patient populations, we must first take a look at the local challenges um, in Northern Michigan. So with the primary goal of improving access to care with collaboration being key. So highlighting some of those local challenges um, include drug abuse, unemployment rates, a high population of psychiatric patients. But one of the things here, just focusing on Emmett County, which is the region right directly um, nearest McLaren, Northern Michigan, is the degree of hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, with true four seasons and degree of inactivity that can occur up here with high snow and ice, limiting people's ability to be as active as they could be if they live, say, in Florida or Hawaii and other places where it's beautiful and sunny, <laughs> much more so than it is up here. Um, to address some of these local challenges, we work very closely with our local health department as well. But this just kind of spotlights that 22% of our residents right now report no routine checkup in the last year. 15.1% of them actually reporting they don't even have their own primary care um, assigned. And they also, almost 20% of the residents report a cost prohibitive care um, and access to care. We do have some specialties resources that are extremely limited like PMR. We only really have that for inpatient rehabilitative services directly local. Endocrinology is also um, very scarce and we could always use more cardiology and primary care services here. Um, with, with working with those local health departments and senior centers, primary care practices and the wellness pavilion, we work to provide not only screenings and prevention classes for the community. Specific to stroke, we actually do the blood pressure checks, the BMI, the point of care testing for diabetes and cholesterol. We're really focusing on providing exit counseling on ways to control their risk factors. for the slide. There it goes. So we're all familiar with the modifiable risk factors for stroke. Um, and, you know, looking at hypertension, smoking, hyperlipidemia, and obesity. But honestly, we're looking at diabetes today because it's exciting that it's continuing to gain momentum with that heightened focus for quality initiatives through the American Heart Association in collaboration with the American Diabetes Association since 34.2 million people have diabetes, which is approximately one in every 10 person. But the sad fact is one in five don't even know they have diabetes. And by 2030, it's estimated to reach approximately 54.9 million. So one of the biggest eye openers for us was when reviewing the statistics and trends and the prevalence of pre-diabetes, 88 million adults, which is more than one in three, actually have pre-diabetes. So that comes to more than eight in 10 adults don't even know they have the pre-diabetes. So education, community awareness is key. Not only can losing the weight and eating healthy, being much more active, cut your risk of type two diabetes, but taking the steps during this phase can actually reverse and stop the damage diabetes will cause. So it's the best time to be proactive and educate. This map of the CDC and recognition of how dark purple our Northern Michigan region is, is really what drives our stroke collaborative in that relentless pursuit of excellence. We are all familiar with those comorbidities that occur with patients diagnosed with diabetes, with today's key focus on stroke and coronary artery disease, which also supports why researchers have found that patients with diabetes have an annual average of $17,000 in medical expenditures, with approximately half of those expenditures attributed to diabetes. 
This is two times higher than the cost of a patient without diabetes. So when we look specifically at McLaren Northern Michigan trends, we're finding that approximately 40% of our patients admitted to our hospital have been previously diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And approximately 30% or more of these patients do receive insulin therapy on any given day while hospitalized. While we're all familiar with the increased risk of infection, ICU admissions, delayed discharges that can occur when patients with diabetes are hospitalized, these were the building blocks of some of our process improvement efforts. Upon admission, patients' oral hyperglycemic meds are discontinued and a strict insulin regimen is initiated to minimize complications and delayed discharges. And upon receiving diabetes honor roll in 2020, our Stroke Collaborative Council began to identify gaps. Our stroke and TIA patients could benefit from a more focused education and risk reduction initiative that spanned beyond traditional nursing education during hospitalization. We began to realize that patients with diabetes is really only the tip of the iceberg. And to truly have an impact on outcomes and cost reduction, we needed to go below the surface and begin focusing on the pre-diabetes patient population. I began speaking with Betsy, our inpatient diabetes care and education specialist, on how we can improve our screening for diabetes and improve diabetes education across that continuum for our stroke patients. Admission with a stroke and TIA makes them a captive audience, and we all know that knowledge and awareness are the first steps to compliance. Screening for diabetes um, became one of our quality initiatives, identifying those patients in need of further evaluation and treatment improving those patient outcomes and minimizing the risk of other serious health complications, such as future strokes. I wanted to briefly share about our robust Stroke Collaborative Council. It is a multidisciplinary team that is extremely engaged with great participation during our monthly meetings. We discuss data trends, case reviews, we celebrate any accomplishment and identify opportunities improvement um, with processes. Our 2021 quality initiative, initiative evolved into setting an A1C trigger for diabetes consultative services and received overwhelming support and approval. The long-term health improvements and risk reduction, along with potential hospital cost savings, propelled this initiative forward to our internal information governance committee to modify our stroke order sets in Cerner. Implementation required prior education and expectation with all nursing staff and hospital service providers. Our next hurdle that we're working on is improving our compliancy with prescribing patients the GLP-1 or SGLT-2 inhibitors to maximize the proven CBD benefit. And it is a work in progress, but I'm confident we'll get there. So to increase utilization of our consultative services, we did modify our stroke order sets. So now it includes a pre-checked nurse communication order instructing the nurse to place a consult for diabetes care and education specialists if the A1C result is 5.7 or greater. And Betsy then will meet with the patients, evaluate their knowledge deficit, and initiate an educational plan. She facilitates outpatient diabetes education and provides outpatient resources. Our successful implementation of this initiative was in part due to the process of presenting it at our Nursing Clinical Practice Council. With the supporting evidence-based practice and our nursing stroke champions, this committee, committee does meet, and it's all made up of nurses, monthly to identify opportunities for improving patient care. So having them be aware of our processes and taking initiative to kind of mentor and get this out among the teams on the nursing units was um, extremely important to the success of our implementation. And we do have nurse champions, stroke champions, that participate on the Stroke Collaborative, and some of them also participate on the Nursing Clinical Practice Council. So some of our key success strategies is really that strong communication across the teams, especially between providers, nursing, and our diabetes care and education specialists. We have targeted education with our nurses and providers, and there's a strong compliance with our risk reduction education, including a patient responsibility component, 
as you can see, this is kind of what our sheet looks like. I'll go in a little bit deeper in the next couple slides, but we meet the patient where they are, trying to understand challenges from that patient's perspective. And then really kind of closing the loop with referral and consultative services that now include patients with pre-diabetes. So this is the top of the document and it obviously still focuses on, we don't want our patients to ever forget that we always wanna make sure they're aware of when to contact um, 911 and not to delay to help with that pre-notification. But then we jump right in and the nurse completes the controlling the risk factors for stroke. They document on there their current cholesterol LDL levels, their blood pressure trends, their A1C, um, what type of antiplatelet medication they've been sent home on and if there's any need for additional um, follow-up with sleep apnea or smoking cessation. This bottom portion is all driven by the patient. They actually complete this um, on the day of discharge after having multiple different touch points of education and they identify whether or not they choose to quit smoking, um, avoid any excessive alcohol, um, eating a heart healthy or Mediterranean diet, uh, their decision to improve their activity and exercise regularly, and as well as understanding about their stroke uh, risk and the type of um, signs and symptoms and how to follow up with their primary care physician and really kind of empowering them and not um, just kind of spoon feeding and giving them their own primary care provider appointment, we empower them to make their follow-up appointment. So I have always been a firm believer that patients do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. So here is my effort in a humorous perspective. <laughs> and I'm going to now turn turn this over to Betsy to share about her offensive strategy and her role in our stroke patients educational process. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon. Um, as Nicole said, I'm the inpatient certified diabetes care and education specialist here at McLaren. Uh, quite a few months ago, Nicole came to me and asked if I uh, saw all stroke patients with diabetes. Now, typically, I see any patient with an A1C over 9%. However, after discussing this with her, we agreed I would evaluate all stroke patients with diabetes and pre-diabetes for educational needs. Now, uh, since pre-diabetes can be reversed through healthy eating, exercise, and weight loss if indicated, um, this would be a great time to help them start making some changes to prevent type two diabetes. And as Nicole mentioned earlier, Eight out of 10 adults don't even know they have prediabetes. Now, if appropriate, education should begin upon admission by our nursing staff. I have provided each unit with a diabetes toolkit that contains educational handouts, diabetes education flip charts to use with patients, demo insulin pens and syringes, a diabetes education booklet, and other educational tools from various companies. Uh, the staff also has access to DVDs, iPads, and videos on the patient's TV that all contain numerous diabetes uh, topics for the patient to view. Now, um, when I uh, do see a patient, I assess their knowledge of diabetes and their readiness to learn. This gives me a good starting point for education. Um, I always try to include the family and or caregivers in the education. Now, some patients I can provide in-depth education while others who aren't ready to learn are given a general overview of the information followed by more in-depth education in the outpatient setting. Now, we're lucky enough to have uh, our internal medicine clinic attached to the hospital, and there we have an accredited diabetes program with a physician assistant who specializes in diabetes 
and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. Now, depending on the patient's needs, I will send a referral to the primary care provider for either a visit to our PA or the diabetes care and education specialist, and oftentimes for both. And many times I have made the appointment for the patient prior to discharge from the hospital. Now, at one point, they did offer the CDC's National Diabetes Prevention Program. However, due to COVID and staffing shortages, it's on hold for now. Um, quite often, I will recommend changes or additions to the patient's home diabetes uh, medications to our hospitalists. And this can depend on the patient's insurance since newer diabetes medications like the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s may not be covered by many insurance companies or the co-pays are unaffordable for the patient. So if a patient is sent home on either one, I will refer them to our outpatient physician assistant because she can help them with the cost of these medications through uh, savings cards, prior authorizations, samples, or patient assistant programs. And she will also find the right medication within these classes that work best for the patient. Now, a, a while back, I came across an excellent article by Lucille Hughes called Think Safe for a crucial elements for diabetes education. And I use this acronym when teaching our nurses about providing education for our patients to ensure a safe discharge. So as you can see, S is for knowing signs and symptoms, A, administration, F for finger stick blood glucose monitoring, and E for emergency numbers and education. Now, I realize not all hospitals have a diabetes care and education specialist. So at minimum, I would suggest locating outpatient diabetes centers near you and recommend that your patients make appointments with them. I would also have a handy supply of patient educational materials available for your nursing staff, as well as teaching them to use this safe method for educating patients. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole and Betsy, for that wonderful presentation. I'd now like to invite Dr. Kimball Poon and Leslie Lexier to the presentation. I can see both of you, welcome. Dr. Poon, the floor is yours and you have control to advance your slides. Good morning and aloha from the beautiful island of Maui. Hey Nalu, surfing has always been an important part of Hawaiian culture. The earliest observers of Polynesian societies noted that the villagers chose their chief according to who was the best surfer. Now, great surf doesn't just happen. You cannot drive up to the beach on any random day and expect an epic surf session. Great surf only happens under optimal conditions. So for surfing, that means ocean swell, energy created by far off storms that brings the waves to the shore. And you also need good wind, light offshore winds to give the waves that beautiful hollow shape. Great surfing requires optimal conditions. Similarly, a strong heart failure program only happens under optimal conditions. That would be effective communication between the quality department and the frontline nurses and providers, patient education to ensure they are capable partners in their care plan, and standardized documentation to make it easy to do the right thing. In the next 15 minutes, Leslie and I will share our experience at Maui Memorial Medical Center 
and share some key tips. If you can develop these three elements at your hospital, you will be in a great position to earn the AHA awards for heart failure and also diabetes and stroke. For some context, we represent Maui Memorial Medical Center, the only acute care hospital on the island of Maui. We serve 200,000 people and are licensed for 219 beds. So we are not big, but we pack a big punch. We offer primary PCI, cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, and neurointerventions. We have eight cardiologists on staff and we screen 309 heart failure charts last year. Effective communication between the quality department and the frontline nurses and providers is the most important condition for a successful heart failure program. And the first thing you need to communicate is the big why, namely these medications and interventions reduce hospitalizations and save lives. If everyone on the front line understands that, then all of our requests for orders and documentation, they're small but necessary steps towards an important goal. But if everyone does not understand the big why, these same requests and reminders are just annoying administrative tasks that make their day jobs harder. So Leslie, tell us, how did you communicate the big why at Maui Memorial? Mm -hmm. Aloha, everyone. Well, when I first took on the role as heart failure lead nine years ago, I realized the importance of establishing a rapport with the staff. Having previously worked in PACU, I was unfamiliar with the floor staff and wasn't entirely sure how to present our heart failure data and our opportunities for improvement. So for buy-in to occur, I really believed it was necessary to create and nurture relationships with the medical staff, nursing staff, health unit clerks, health care aides, and dietitians, just to name a few. For the first few years, I began to hold monthly heart failure in services. Dr. Poon was one of our most popular guest speakers, and we are forever grateful for his continued contributions to our program. The in-services were brought directly to the units where the majority of the heart failure patients were being cared for. And every month, a different guest speaker was invited, ranging from cardiologists to dietitians to pharmacists. The educational opportunity was open to everyone throughout the hospital, and breakfast was always a huge incentive to attend. The monthly in-services were a great opportunity to present any changes to the guidelines that were important for the staff to know. And these in-service programs were filmed and posted online on the hospital's intranet site for the staff to watch anytime, which was especially helpful to the night shift crew. Currently, I try to regularly attend unit huddles and staff meetings as much as possible to share AHA guidelines and any updates. Ah, uh, yes, those morning seven o'clock meetings. <laughs> I remember <laughs> that the staff really appreciated that we came to them and they didn't have to use, leave the unit. Uh, to go to the auditorium. I also remember having a little less white hair uh, back then. The most problematic metric at Mount Memorial, and probably for you guys, is documenting follow-up within seven days. Mm -hmm. Leslie, how does communication help us achieve that goal? So follow-up appointments seem to be one of the biggest challenges for most everyone. And these are some powerful tips and tricks that we have learned over time. Number one, have someone own the follow-up appointments. At Maui Memorial Medical Center, it is the unit clerks and the case managers that own it, and they communicate effectively with each other. Secondly, for patients discharged to a skilled nursing facility, we have pre-approved set appointments in place, and that is the date only for guidelines. So if a patient was discharged today to SNF, they would have a set appointment in place for tomorrow or the following day, depending on the location. Anticipating a weekend or evening discharge is always helpful to avoid any fallouts from occurring. And communication between the unit clerks and case managers is vital. And lastly, if all else fails, we have an opportunity to conduct a follow-up phone call and obtain a follow-up appointment at that time. That follow-up phone call sheet becomes a permanent part of the chart. And phone calls are typically placed 72 hours after a patient is discharged and the call is conducted by a unit clerk. When a patient has a health or safety concern, it is communicated to a nurse and the call is redirected. Three attempts are made to reach the patient during the follow-up phone call process. 
So with any large quality project, it's critical to share our successes and failures with both the frontline staff and the administration. What's our cadence for feedback? So hard failure data and opportunities for improvement are regularly presented at monthly quality meetings with nursing representatives from each unit. And these nursing representatives are responsible to take the information back to their units and share with the staff. Each unit has a quality board on display, which highlights any pertinent data. Once a month, a hospital leadership meeting occurs called the Quality Management Committee, where we present heart failure data along with our performance improvement plans. And we also have Dr. Andrew Sumita, who is our heart failure champion, and he peer reviews all heart failure mortalities as well as readmissions within 30 days. Dr. Sumita's findings are then shared with the Department of Medicine at their monthly peer review meetings. So it sounds like we do regular feedback at monthly intervals, but you also deliver real-time feedback using a neat feature within Epic called Secure Chat. Can you tell us about that? Well, during the work week, I conduct heart failure concurrent rounds. Epic, which is our electronic medical record, identifies patients with heart failure, and then the charts are screened following the AHA evidence-based guidelines. Typically, around 10 charts are screened daily. A newer tool for us is the availability to chat within EPIC. And chatting can occur with many members of the healthcare team. And this tool is super helpful to discuss, for example, DVT prophylaxis with the nursing staff. If I notice that a patient is not ambulating independently and SCDs are not on, I chat with the bedside nurse, coaching him or her to encourage SCD usage or to notify the physician for possible chemical prophylaxis and of course, always to document. Another great way to communicate is a message in the in-basket within EPIC. Communicating the big why among the healthcare teams is important, but it's also critical that the patients understand the big why so they can be capable partners in their care. Hospitalized patients are a captive population. Our local television isn't scintillating, and during COVID, there was restricted visitation, so there's not much to distract them. Many patients rave about all the helpful, easily digestible information we give them during their hospitalization. Leslie, what's in this heart failure goodie bag? So all heart failure patients are offered an educational packet soon after arrival. The health unit clerks take ownership in producing these educational packets. Information on the AHA interactive workbook is included in the patient education packet. And all the nursing units now have iPads, which may be brought directly to the patient's bedside, and the link to the interactive workbook on the home screen is set up for them. And patients may browse throughout the workbook at their leisure. Also included in the patient education packet is that ever-popular green, yellow, red zone sheet. And some of the units even laminate it and put a magnet on the back and encourage patients mm -hmm. to put it on their fridges when they get home. Yeah, also included is a smoking cessation flyer as well as a heart failure informational booklet. We were very fortunate to have a dietary intern, Shaylin Chand, who created the beautiful therapeutic lifestyle change diet flyer. And this qualifies for the diabetes treatment measure. On the lower left, you will see that we address the common local foods, which are high in salt. Our patients usually get a great big laugh when they see this list, as it is typically their favorite foods. So it gives us a great opportunity to educate our patients on which foods to avoid or at the very least limit. It's important we reach patients when they're outside the hospital, too, when they are residential and to reach their friends and family who form their support network. One of my favorite events is the annual Community Heart Failure event. Mm -hmm. Leslie, why do you think the community likes this event so much? Oh. Six years ago, we began offering our community members an opportunity to attend a heart failure fair at the hospital. We didn't want our community to only visit the hospital during times of illness or injury. We wanted to share a positive educational experience. And so we started this fun, free, and educational community event for people to learn about heart care and heart failure prevention. We offered informational booths where community resources shared information. We had entertainment, and we also had a heart-healthy meal mm -hmm. created by our very own chef, Greg Gaspar. Mm -hmm. That same event was offered throughout the year on the topics of stroke and diabetes. 
And we created this dream team, which was a group of very dedicated employees who became the planning committee for these events. And this past year, because of COVID, we conducted the heart failure event virtually, which was viewed by 513 people wow. from the general public. That was awesome. Standardized documentation makes it easy to do the right thing. Specifically, it harnesses the awesome power of checklists, something that Atul Gawande articulates powerfully in his book, The Checklist Manifesto. Specifically, the providers at Maui Memorial use an awesome heart failure smart phrase. Our brilliant chief of staff, Konstantin Novoselsky, built it and more importantly, continually updates it. You can see this well-designed smart phrase reminds providers to prescribe the evidence-based medications, beta blockers, ACE, ARNI, and now the SGLT2 inhibitors. When the EF is under 35, the smart phrase even knows to ask you about ICD and cardiac resynchronization therapy. Leslie, tell us how you and the nurses use smart documentation. Oh, I personally use smart phrases to remind the nursing staff to document the minutes of education, to offer information on the interactive workbook, and to arrange a follow-up appointment date and time within seven days. I will subsequently note when 60 minutes of heart failure education has been achieved and or when information on the interactive workbook was given. And then I personally acknowledge the nurse who provided that documentation. The smart phrase for nurses quickly and easily allows staff to document the minutes of education, to document their referral to the workbook, and to document their referral to the TLC diet buyer. In summary, a strong heart failure program like a great surf session needs optimal conditions that would be effective communication between the quality department and the frontline nurses and providers, patient education to ensure they are capable partners in their care plan, and standardized documentation to make it easy to do the right thing. These processes require upfront investment and continual nurturing. But if you commit to creating these conditions, you can earn the AHA awards for heart failure diabetes, and stroke. So these are our email addresses. If you have questions or you want to see the forms we use, reach out and we'll send them to you. And if you're on Maui and the swell and wind are good, reach out and we'll enjoy some Hei Nalu together. Thanks for your time. You bet. Mahalo. Thank you so much, Dr. Poon and Leslie, um, for that engaging presentation. It's now my pleasure um, to move to our final presentation today before our panel discussion. Uh, Regina and Morgan, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, we are uh, coming to you from Southeast Hospital in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. We are within walking distance of the Mississippi River, so it's uh, not uncommon to go downtown, get an ice cream or a cup of coffee and just walk the edge of the river and kind of enjoy that. Next slide. Um, some of the awards that we've worked uh, hard the last few years to earn, um, just a lot of different things. We are Stark Hospital. We have achieved the uh, Silver Plus for the uh, heart failure, and we are also a CCC recognized uh, cardiac facility also. So we were one of the first seven hospitals to achieve that. So we're always striving, looking for things that need improved, and sometimes that earned you a little recognition. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Morgan Seamer. I'm the heart failure nurse practitioner for Southeast Hospital. I've been here um, going on two years. Um, kind of wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about our heart failure team. Um, we do have multiple disciplinaries involved. Um, we do, um, our cardiologists are all involved and easy to contact. Um, we have myself. Uh, we have a lot of pharmacists on board that help with education and monitoring those uh, heart failure medications. Um, we have our transitional care team. Um, we have a great cardiac rehab team. Uh, I have a, an awesome staff over at the clinic side of things too. Um, we've kind of newly introduced palliative care and more of the diabetic nurse educator um, stuff into our group. Uh, Cath Lab has a big um, role in our clinic too as far as you know most of our patients get cardiac caths or 
pacemakers or ICDs placed. Um, quality obviously has a big role in making sure we're meeting our guidelines. Um, we do have monthly meetings, sometimes weekly, depending on the topics or if there's a, a new um, guideline we need to add to our order sets. Um, dietary, the dietitians have played a huge role for our education for our patients too. Um, so lot, lots of people on our team for our patients. Next slide, please. Some of the new processes that we looked at whenever we needed to meet the diabetic measures as they were added to the heart failure uh, team was first of all, of course, no additional funds were allocated. So we were looking to see what we could do with what we had already. And it made sense to add the diabetic educator to the heart failure team. So she joined us and uh, was able to use uh, the, the reports that she received already along with uh, the reports that we had built for uh, ejection fractions. We have uh, reports that are used daily by Morgan, by our cardiac rehab department. And we actually were a little extra and we, we have a report before the report. So if they've not made certain reports, we're able to see if their EF is low and maybe that's not even been read yet. So mm -hmm. we've actually had a few really good catches mm -hmm. by working with that report mm -hmm. too. So we were able to kind of get her more information and help her to cross-reference our patient denominator so that she could really focus in that way no one was overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, Morgan uses a lot of dot phrases also, and she'll talk about that in a minute, just to help us, uh, you know, it's a good uh, safety net. We never wanna build a process around a person. We want to use those processes so that, uh, so good example, Morgan had a baby about a year ago. Mm -hmm. So when she was out, we needed all those layers of, uh, you know, just different uh, things built in so that we didn't let anyone fall through the crack, even though she was not here and she's sort of our glue. Mm -hmm. um, we built reports for the hemoglobin A1C for her, for the uh, heart failure, I mean, for the uh, diabetic nurse mm -hmm. educator, uh, so that she would able to see anyone with a history of uh, heart failure or diabetes and then cross-reference those. So we've just tried to build a lot of safety nets in so that uh, people are caught at one level or the other. Our cardiac rehab girls are, the yeah, they are, they're extraordinary. Um, they are talking to Morgan every day as they see patients, if it's making sure it's someone she didn't miss, if it's a new one, or if Morgan sees someone, she's uh, always communicating with them. So just having a good rapport and it's not uncommon for me to get a text or a call hey let's look at this patient or i do the same with them so we're always watching that denominator just to provide the best care um, the daily reports that we receive uh, come to our email from our uh, bi department and we're able to capture all of those heart failure patients so um, they're always quick too if something new pops up that we need that uh, added to those reports then they work with us to make sure that mm -hmm. we get those added. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about our heart failure order set for our patients that we've added in. Some have been in for a while, some are more recent. Uh, we make sure case management is consulted um, in case they have any, if they are from a skilled facility or if they have home health needs at home, just to kind of help correlate the big picture and make sure that patient has uh, every resource they need at discharge. Um, like we talked about, our diabetic nurse specialist has been on board um, very eagerly also for our patients to educate them. Um, all of our patients get a dietitian consult. Um, and then we've also added the palliative care consult, especially for those patients that have maybe had two or three heart failure admissions in the last year, um, just to see if they need an extra in-home health um, resource. So it's actually an, another advanced practice provider that goes into the patient's home to evaluate them in their environment and make sure they don't have any further questions about diet or medications or maybe a patient that can't drive to the office to see me, but having that extra set of eyes in the home setting uh, has been very beneficial. And I've been in close, close communication with our palliative care team to provide extra services to those patients at home too. Next slide, please. Um, so here is an example of uh, my main dot phrase that I use here in the hospital. They're very similar from hospital to the office. Um, I double check all of their EKGs and um, like to make sure everybody's had an, a recent echocardiogram or a cardiac catheterization. 
Uh, we discuss their uh, New York Heart Association class, um, go through their core measure medications, so the beta blockers, the ACE, the ARB, um, you know, the new new combination medications, um, the diabetic medications that are now approved for heart failure, those SGLT2 inhibitors, um, what diuretic medications they may, may be maintained on. A lot of our patients are on drips while they're here in the hospital, and we have to make sure they're transitioned to a regimen that's going to work for them at home prior to discharge. Um, I address the life vest with patients if they qualify for that. Uh, like we talked about our um, diabetic educator or specialist and our dietitians. Um, we want to make sure we're checking their labs, their renal function, um, heart rate, blood pressure. These medications can affect all of that. We've got to make sure we're covering all of our bases there. Um, I do perform heart failure education with our patients, uh, talk about their daily weights uh, and when they should call me in the clinic, um, talk about a fluid restriction. Uh, we discuss sodium restrictions and why that's important for managing their heart failure symptoms. Um, for follow-up, I see all of my heart failure patients post-discharge three to five days as long as they're able to make it in the clinic. Um, I also call all of my heart failure discharges uh, within 24 to 48 hours. We make sure they've gotten all their medications, make sure they have what they need at home, uh, remind them about their appointment with me in clinic. Uh, life gets busy and some of our patients overlook those appointments, of course, so we want to give them a reminder of that. Um, make sure, like I said, the medications. And then we discuss that diet one more time too, because I know they love talking to me about watching their sodium. So um, I document how much time I spend educating my patients, um, reviewing charts for them and making sure they have all the handouts. And uh, we have a folder, um, it, that's kind of our goodie bag in the office. We have a, a red folder that has our CHF clinic information in that. We have lots of handouts. Uh, one of my favorites is called the uh, the Salty Six. It just has like frozen pizza and deli meats and breads and some of those foods that are very common in our diet, but that are some of the higher ones uh, in sodium. Um, we have like a, a stoplight sheet that we call it too, um, with different levels of, you know, hey, your weight's starting to trend up. Maybe you should give the CHF clinic a, a phone call and make sure um, sometimes we can discuss matters over the phone, but sometimes it's best to just have them coming in for that face-to-face -face follow up. Um, so uh, I chart this on all of my heart failure patients that I see every day in the hospital um, and in clinic in the afternoon. So it's just kind of like Regina said, it kind of wraps everything up. And if somebody from the team is out for a day or a week or an extended maternity leave, then we can kind of all follow this guideline and make sure we're taking care of things for our patients. Um, a couple of new things we're talking about adding is to make sure our patients are on the statin and then um, our palliative care team um, going to add in, you know, a little adopt phrase about that as well to make sure we're covering all of our bases for our patients. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the other processes that we've seen come to light that worked well for us and it might work for you is that uh, we have a diabetic educator who's transition, uh, who is housed in our transition, transitional care unit. Um, so she's in that department and whenever they do follow up phone calls for our patients every day, as they divide that workload, anyone with a history of diabetic uh, diabetes or, uh, and or heart failure, those go to her. So she's making those calls for them. And uh, that gives her a lot of insight as far as like when she was here and then uh, post uh, discharge uh, appointments that might be made with our uh, outpatient diabetic clinic or with their uh, primary care providers, just, you know, however that follow up is going to be for them, what that's going to look like. We do have a large indigent population where we live. So um, just the way that we have to approach those different populations and how do we meet their needs best for them. Um, those uh, follow-up phone calls that they're receiving from Morgan, then they're also receiving one. Some of the things that we have added um, just recently to this denominator is on that follow-up phone call from the hospital, we're asking, uh, you know, a lot of times I think so many people see a patient when they're here that maybe they leave and um, they didn't absorb all those visits. So they're just kind of bringing to mind to remembrance a little bit, do they remember you know, the diabetic educator coming to the room? Do they remember palliative care? Anyone having a conversation around that or disease management? 
um, just to kind of keep those uh, things alive and keep them uh, thinking about that and making sure that those appointments are also completed. Through uh, the transitional care department and the work that they've done, we were able to completely eliminate our penalty for heart failure readmissions. Uh, those are also reviewed by one of our cardiologists and we talk about those at our meetings every month. Um, our uh, transitional care department, they're rock stars. So um, they've really, uh, you know, as you're doing processes, processes aren't sexy. But when you see the outcome from those, that's when that uh, that's when you really get that payday. So just continuing to do the same thing for everybody. Um, we've seen a lot of great outcomes from that. Um, so the dietitians also received, like she said, the same orders that uh, we send to the uh, to the diabetic nurse and they actually have a new team that they're working on together to kind of tag team you know as everybody's experiencing um, a lack in um, uh, employees uh, we're trying to find ways to be more efficient in our work so the dietitians and the uh, diabetic educator actually are working on new processes now where they can kind of tag team each other and um, see who they can cover and divide on those classes of those patients. So uh, we're seeing a lot of good work being done just to try to utilize and be uh, more effective. Um, notifications are sent to the primary provider's offices also by the diabetic nurse educator. Um, let's say the patient comes in and this is a new diabetic or so forth, um, they are able to relay that information. So um, lots of work going on after discharge and that's where I think that uh, continuum of care is so important to help push those return visits outside the 30-day window and to make that patient more efficient at home and know more about their disease process. Next slide please. So our diabetic educator was able to share with me, uh, she would she would have joined us today but she's out today, uh, she was able to share with us a lot of the scripting for her calls so that they're sure to, you know, uh, cover anything that could be an issue for that patient at home, just to kind of reinforce good habits and to also kind of educate the patient to their own disease process. So a lot of things here that she would ask them that might give her more insight as to any issues that could be going on at home. Next, call, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of some of her charting as far as the education that she was able to provide then. And then these also open up other forms and then she's able to share from here with the uh, provider's offices after discharge just to give them a good idea of what um, information was gathered here um, and provide that post discharge to them. Next slide, please. Um, and then also here, she's able to document the education that she provided and just a, a very complete uh, package here in what they have assembled just to make sure that we're meeting all the needs of those patients. Next slide, please. Um, that's all we have. Can you think of anything else? That we're always looking for new processes and things to just to add, just to, you know, to trial and see if those work. And, um, looking for ways to support that patient denominator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morgan and Regina. And now at this time, I'd like to invite all of our speakers uh, to join back on video if you're able to, and, and we'll move into a uh, panel discussion. And this will be followed by any questions, um, audience questions. So as a reminder, every um, the audience, you can continue to submit uh, questions using your control panel. So what I know um, Nicole and Betsy won't be able to join on video, but I, they uh, will be able to come off mute. Okay, so thank you all. It's so wonderful to have, you know, the um, perspectives from heart failure and stroke teams and also, um, you know, multiple states. We have Maui, um, Missouri, and also Michigan. Um, so a couple time zones here today. Um, so our first question, and this really can go to anybody, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear if, if you could speak to any modifications, if any, uh, that your team has made in your processes based on feedback um, or insights from your patients.
Uh, I can speak to when we have our wonderful heart failure community yeah. event that we get real-time feedback. Our, uh, every member that comes to the heart failure community event, they receive a survey right then and there. And we ask them, you know, what did you like about our event? What didn't you like? What would you like to see in future events? Um, specifically, I'd like to mention with our Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander community, our CEO, Michael Rembus, he actually goes out into the community and he speaks to the kapuna, who are the elderly, elders in the community, and he asks them, what are your needs and, and, and what improvements uh, could we be doing here at Maui Memorial to better meet your needs and be culturally sensitive? That's wonderful. Thank you, Leslie. And I, you know, love hearing about that, um, you know, the very local approach, that patient-centered approach. Um, does anybody else, would anyone else like to chime in? I know that our transitional care department, um, you know, when they make these calls and they also go visit our um, readmission patients and, you know, try to figure out exactly what the cause, you know, what brought them back in they found out that so some of them are as basic as needs for food so we are sponsoring a food bank that they are really a big part in driving just to make sure that when that patient goes home that they actually have uh, food to meet their basic needs it's hard to ask them to be real involved in medications if, if they're not even getting food so um, we're trying to uh, address basic needs and then move forward from there Wonderful. Thank you, Regina. Renee, just oh, some of the things ahead. we can share from that stroke perspective, because they're doing a fabulous job on the heart failure side, is we do have a small uh, stroke survey that we give our patients at the time of discharge, really kind of assessing if they truly know their risk uh, factors and do they feel prepared to go home at discharge. So it's something we get that right time feedback right at that time. And when I round on patients and talk with them, there are different feedback measures we can get from them on uh, ways that we can improve our educational um, efforts and our processes there. But also one of the feedbacks we got is being able to get connected to that outpatient. Cause it's one thing when they're getting inundated by different types of education, not just diabetes, but stroke signs and symptoms and risk reduction measures and things like that. It's so overwhelming and it's such a, so much packed in in such a short period of time is that's part of the reason that we have that risk reduction form on paper so they can take it home with them um, as well as providing um, resources out in the community. We work with our home health uh, nursing staff as well to provide and connect with our stroke support groups um, and even through COVID we maintained a virtual presence um, and we still have virtual, we've continued the virtual and we've expanded on that to include other McLaren uh, subsidiaries to um, provide stroke support group virtually to all stroke patients um, through that network. Um, one of the other things too is in the community during, um, when before COVID is when we would go to um, like health screening events, uh, senior center expos, and even the school um, and doing education, getting just feedback from the people on what we can do to make that awareness more prevalent. And just kind of sharing that some of that education that we've done, not just diabetes specific, but just stroke awareness, the BFAST alone. We actually had a pediatric stroke patient that through her uh, event of education, she actually recognized a stroke in herself and was able to uh, get the teacher's attention and she had a large vessel occlusion and that was from awareness, a community awareness event. So taking some of that feedback from our community and what we can access um, to not just educate diabetes, but just stroke in general. So we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from community events and um, our surveys. Wow, thank you, Nicole, for sharing that. And you know, I, just hearing about this um, continuous quality improvement and how the feedback comes from all angles and that patient community perspective is so important. Um, so next, and I'm, I'm thinking quite a bit about Southeast Health, but anyone's uh, welcome to join uh, or to respond. Um, uh, Regina and Morgan, you talked quite a bit about process change and, uh, changes or enhancements for the patient population that has that history or new diagnosis of diabetes. Um, can you speak to any you know, barriers or challenges that you experienced along the way? Um, yeah, I can definitely speak to that. Um, 
medication cost um, is a, a big deal for our patients. Um, case management helps with that. Pharmacy, you know, helps with that. Um, patient assistance funds are important for our patients, um, whether that be through Southeast or um, like a local ph pharmacy coupon or program they might have or through the drug company itself, um, especially as these medications are evolving for more um, more guidelines and more indications. It's, you know, it's one thing if we could start the patients on those medications while they're here in the hospital, um, we've really got to make sure they're able to get those outpatient too, um, or it really doesn't do us, you know, it doesn't do the patient any good at home if they can't afford the medication. So, um, and you know, I know that's always been a long-standing issue for patients, but that's one of the biggest barriers I've seen is as new indications roll out for these medications, we still have to make sure mm -hmm. patients can afford those and take them at home. And Dr. Poon, I see you nodding your head. I, it sounds like, looks like there's some agreement there. Um, do you have anything to add? No, I, I thought the answer was beautifully delivered. It just, it makes me sad. You know, so we just, we could spend a hundred thousand dollars in the hospital and patient can't afford the pills at home. You know, just a tragedy. Right. Does anyone else have any challenges, uh, barriers you experienced along the way of making um, some of the changes that all of you, you know, presented? If I could just speak briefly about in the relation to the stroke is is just kind of capitalizing on what Dr. Um, Poon had mentioned about getting the why out there for people to understand the why behind the new efforts and the new processes that it's just not making more work for people. And the same thing with making sure that resources are affordable to the patients when they do go home. So it's very nice that our inpatient uh, diabetes care specialist works very closely with the outpatient with that collaboration so that it's a smooth transition for them in accessing those resources. Thanks, Nicole. So I have uh, two more questions before we move to the audience Q&A and I see some wonderful questions coming in from our audience. Um, so we have, you know, a diverse audience here of um, nurses, uh, physicians, quality improvement professionals, and and more. Uh, what advice do do you have for our listeners who might be working to establish or strengthen a team-based approach for diabetes and um, CBD care? And anyone is welcome to to respond. I have some advice. Um, when I first took on this role, I was very new to quality management and I was new to evidence-based care and guidelines and my manager was super knowledgeable but she was really busy so I think networking is really important reach out to other hospitals within your area other hospitals within the state I'm really I love to mentor others so I'm very open if you would ever like to contact me and we can brainstorm and I can let you work, uh, let you know what works really, really well for us here at Maui Memorial and share our evidence-based practice. I would, I would add to that that any team I've ever uh, been involved in or that we've uh, built from the ground up is to look for people who are engaged in that, you know, uh, there have been a few times that we've disbanded an entire team and rebuilt because not everyone's engaged, but every team I've ever been on, I, I sort of feel like I'm assembling the super friends, you know, I don't know if any of you guys were alive in the 70s, but you know, the super friends, uh, you knew you were going to get something done in that 30 minute episode. So I, I that's kind of how I approach any team is I just feel like um, get the right people at the table. And it's amazing what you can get done. So that would be my advice. Thank you, that's that's really wonderful advice. Um, so my last question before we go into a few audience uh, Q&A is, what do you see or hope for um, for the future in this field of work? Well, I'm really excited for the future and I know you are too, Dr. Poon. And we're very honored to be um, a part of the American Heart Association and it, being a part of the AHA and these get with the guidelines, they're scientifically proven. This is evidence-based care. It kind of takes the guessing work out of everything for us. So we're very honored to be uh, affiliated with this great organization, and we really look forward to the future of heart care.
Thank you, Leslie. And any other um, final words from the other panelists? Otherwise, we'll move into our questions. Okay. Well, I want to thank um, our three hospitals so much for presenting today, for sharing so many you know, local examples and engaging in this um, Q&A. And I will go ahead and read some audience uh, questions. Um, before I do that, I did want to remind everyone that uh, we do have many resources on our awards program, and we encourage everyone to visit nodiabetesbyheart.org. Okay, so we have about uh, four minutes for questions. So the, the first one, um, let's see. So this can really go to, I think to anybody, but the question is, what have you found as the most well-received method for providing staff with meaningful process improvement feedback? Might be a tough, a tough one, go ahead. Hey, it's Kimball. So I think feedback immediately and then just write to the person. I find that when people send emails to like 20 people, it's just, just have email fatigue. But I think it's very important to just, when you see bad things, but also good things, see the nurse go out of the way to explain the relationship between salt and, and, and water retention is huge. So recognizing, but quickly, and I personally go to Starbucks and I buy $10 gift cards and I just keep a stack in my desk. And I think for all the leaders out there, it's worth doing just a handwritten card and. You'd be surprised. Sometimes I'll, I'll go past a nurse's station and I'll find that they have a card that I taped up from a year ago and on the fifth floor tele station. There was a thank you card I wrote. Uh, a, tel a teletech had actually recognized a cardiac arrest very quickly, and that thank you card was still there over a year later. So recognize with a card and, if possible, small small tokens. Thank you. So uh, this next question is uh, for McLaren. The question is, um, does your hospital have a CFF, CHF program as well? And is the diabetes educator consulted for A1C um, greater than or equal to 5.7? So that might be um, perhaps for Betsy. Well, I can share that we do have a CHF program. Um, it is not, um, we don't, have the AHA part with that. We used two years ago, but just due to resources, we are not doing that at this point. It is a goal to resume that, but currently right now we do not have that in process. But I'll let Betsy speak to her involvement as far as the A1C, but our A1C trigger was new for stroke specifically. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's a really good question. And unfortunately, um, I'm not consulted for A1Cs. Um, I do uh, print a list every day of A1Cs over 9% or 9% and above uh, for all patients. But um, yeah, it might be nice um, to target the heart failure patients as well. So you, you gave me uh, an idea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think this is probably, um, I could go to a, to a few of you. With regards to the DOT phrases, are providers using the medication documentation phrase in each, of, in each of their notes or only at the end when preparing patients for discharge? And then a second part of the question is, are these phrases being triggered by um, patients' parameters? Um. So I can speak to this. Um, I use a dot phrase on every single visit that I see a patient, whether it be in the clinic, whether it be my initial visit in the hospital, second, third, fourth, or my dish, you know, day of discharge. Um, I use it every visit. I've found that if I stay in that routine, it's easier for me to make sure I'm covering all the guidelines for each patient. Uh, especially closer to discharge, we wanna really hit on that education that they can take home with them and uh, just reinforcing the importance of that follow-up phone call and their follow-up appointment with me in the CHF clinic. Thank you. And you know, I think that's all the time um, that we have for questions. And these are wonderful questions, and I will be sharing them with all of our presenters, um, those that we didn't have a chance um, to answer today. 
So I'd like to close by thanking our presenters for leading today's webinar and to thank all of you for your participation in today's event. As I mentioned, we encourage you to visit nodiabetesbyheart.org for past webinars, podcasts, latest guidelines, and more. Just a reminder, um, after today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email with a survey on the presentations. In that email, you will also receive a link to view a recording of today's presentations. If you are unable to download today's um, uh, PDF of all of the slides, please feel free to reach out to us and we will send that to you. On behalf of the American Heart Association and our presenters, thank you for joining and have a great day. This concludes today's presentation.